Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today is that lesson from St. Paul's letter to the Roman Christians in the 12th chapter. But I'd like to read to you the gospel lesson for today, which is from Matthew chapter 16, which dovetails with that lesson. Here, Matthew writes, from that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great sufferings at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not take step before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So here we have this story of Jesus who is explaining to his disciples, and especially to Peter in no uncertain terms, that he is going to go to the cross. That he is going to go and he is going to do something that the world sees as foolish, as humiliating, as horrifying, and he is going to do that so that he can be raised on the third day, giving us eternal life. We see these words that explain to us how Jesus had to take Peter aside and explain to him that he was focused on earthly things and not on divine things. St. Paul seems to be elaborating on all of that when he says to us, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, and he goes through this amazing list of how we should care for other people, of how we should work through our lives being the types of people who live for and care for other people. And I have to say that it seems like the best of humanity always shows up in the midst of a disaster. We look on our television screens, and maybe last week we were just appalled by what we were seeing and the, and the force of, of God's creation as, as water flooded into Houston and as hurricanes hit, winds blew, and all of the structures and things that we built seem so tiny and disturbed by what we saw as how much damage and destruction that was doing to people in their lives and the things that they had. But then we started to see things shift, didn't we? We started to see these people arrive with boats and we started to see people caring for one another and, and, and even having to chop into their, their roof in order to get people out of their homes and being able to, to take risks and some people even gave their lives so that they could save others. And suddenly we saw the best of humanity. We saw that caring part, those things that Paul was talking about when he, when he says that we should love one another with a mutual affection and we should not lag in zeal but be ardent in spirit. We saw that kind of zeal, we saw that kind of spirit as people loved one another and loved people they had never met. Loved people that they were probably willing to honk at and yell at as they were driving on the roads or, or say nasty things on the internet too, but suddenly in the midst of that struggle, we're willing to care in the most amazing ways. And I ask myself, so why does it take a tragedy? Why does there have to be a tragedy for us to see this? Why does there have to be a tragedy for it to seem like people care for each other in this way? And as I thought about it and looked at the text, I began to realize that we are attracted to Peter's point of view. We're attracted to Peter's point of view because his point of view is to say, Jesus, you're special. You teach well, and you heal people, and you have done these miracles. You should never be harmed. Jesus, you're the one. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's what Matthew tells us that Peter confessed. Jesus, you're not just special. You're God's Son. And so nothing should ever happen to you. You can't even think about putting yourself in a position where people would harm you. It can't happen. And that's when Jesus steps in, says to him in the most strong terms we ever see, Peter, you're the deceiver. You're the one who's acting on Satan's behalf at this point. And we notice that Peter was 
pretty strong about this. The words that Matthew used, he rebuked Jesus. Can you imagine going to God and rebuking God? That, that, that one's, you know, a little lost on me, right? Peter who says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then, and then suddenly he's done. You know what? You got this wrong, dude. <laughs> That's what Peter was doing in our terms. He was strongly telling Jesus that he was wrong. He was out of line for thinking these things. And Jesus says, you have your mind on the wrong things, Peter. You're looking at the earthly things and not the divine things. You see, when we look at the earthly things, we look at the things that attract us, we see that we don't want to sacrifice. We want to be comfortable. We don't want to be hurting. We want everything taken care of in our lives. We want to believe that we would be honored and respected by other people. That we would, in short, be winners. Winners in our lives. People who can see how great we are and who give us the honor and glory that we deserve. That's what the world wants to tell us. If you just work hard enough, if you just do the right thing, somehow you will be honored, you'll be special, and everything will be wonderful. And that's what Peter's telling Jesus. You're on the track, man. You're going to get there. Everybody sees who you are. They'll honor you. They'll give you that glory. And we have that attraction as well. We have that attraction to see those things. And i got to say, our attraction for seeing earthly things is fed really, really well by the media. Now, I'm not blaming the media here. I'm not going to get on that bandwagon saying how horrible the news people are. It's just, let's face it, we're more interested in seeing the things where somebody wins. We're more interested in seeing the things where, where there's some sort of struggle. We're more interested because we know that, the, as the old axiom says, bad news sells. Bad news sells. We, we just we can't seem to turn away from it. We just got, got to watch, right? Something bad happened. We want to see what it was, how it was. It doesn't take much to figure that one out and see that one. When you're driving down the road, there are some emergency vehicles and everything slows down. Even if it shouldn't slow down, everything slows down because everybody's got to take a look and see what's going on, right? We were, we, were, we were coming home last night, we were coming down the El Camino, and everything was slowed down because somebody had passed out, something had happened, I don't know, and, and everybody slows down, even though they shouldn't have. And so, bad news sells. Excess sells also. When people seem to have more than others, when something's grander than others, that sells. We see that on, on television, we see that in the news. Controversy sells. If you don't think controversy sells, all you gotta do is look at politics, right? There are no, apparently there are no good people in politics anymore, okay? Everybody's gotta be all the way some direction or other because somebody's telling you all the horrible things about, because controversy sells. We can't even believe that anybody's trying to do what's right for us anymore, right? And sadly, Tragedy sells also. Showing tragedy gets ratings. Now, I'm just as guilty as everybody else of wanting to watch it and figure out how to help and what to do. I was, you know, turning my TV to, to the channels that kept showing 24 hours a day what was going on in Houston. Because there's part of us that's compassionate and really cares. And so, in some ways, the fact that it's a tragedy isn't really what sells, it's the fact that we are concerned that we do care. And what we see is that as tragedy happens, suddenly people start to help. Suddenly people start to do good deeds. Suddenly we see people coming and getting that label of hero. Suddenly all of humanity is looking to do things that are right. And Jesus prevails. Following Jesus, taking up your cross, taking up those things that are a burden, taking up sacrifice, doing things that others wouldn't do, starts to prevail as people start helping one another. And for just a brief moment, we get to see it. We get to see something that usually doesn't sell. We get to see the good news. We get to see the amazing things that are happening as people are caring for one another. And so I ask myself that question, which will we follow? Will we follow the divine or will we follow the earthly? Will we follow wanting to see the next controversy or the next bad news or will we focus on the fact that there are people who are caring for one another? And again, my mind goes back to how long will we stay focused on the good things before we're right back to where we were, whining about the bad things and looking at them. Yesterday, we were coming home. Friday night, we uh, took a mini vacation. We went up to San Francisco where Katie had a couple of rooms for us at the Fairmont. She gets at a deep discount for working for those folks. 
It had been a long time since I'd been in the Fairmont, San Francisco. In fact, it took me back to my days when I used to sing in a German choir at Zion Lutheran Church. We would go with our little fake later hosen and everything and go sing to some sort of San Francisco German club, okay? And I can, I can remember being in the hotel, because of course, how do you forget that when you're nine or 10 years old and see an amazing building, an amazing place? And so we had, a, we had a great time, but on our drive in and on our drive out, we had to drive through some streets that are less than beautiful and see a lot of people living on the streets who look like they're in the midst of a tragedy. And it's a struggle sometimes to get through those streets, not just because of the people that you see, but because of the traffic that's going on and the heat, but of course, your eye is taken to people who are struggling and who are hurting. And on the way back out, and on the way in, actually, I remembered and reminded the, 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 uh, Andrew and Katie that this was a place where years ago we had gone at night at Christmas time with Menlo Atherton High School for Project Backpack, which was a time when we took backpacks and we, they were filled with uh, uh, things that people need, like uh, blankets and socks and underwear and basic things we expect to have in our houses, and took them to people who had none of those things. And it was every night that we did that, every time we did that, it was an amazing experience to see these young people who, who had mostly everything bringing things to those who had very little. And the response of the people as they received those things. And I was thinking to myself how when we did that, there were no news cameras, there was nobody watching, there was nobody saying, look, there's these kids doing this cool stuff. It just happened. Because somebody cared enough to go out and to care for those who had less. Because somebody did things that were good. Because somebody said, let's sacrifice a little and follow Jesus and do what helps other people. And I began to realize that every day there are people doing those things. Every day there are people out there picking up their cross and following Jesus. Every day there are people in small ways and in big ways saying, I'm not going to focus on what's earthly. I'm going to focus on what's divine. Every day, there are people following these words that St. Paul gives to us about how we should care for one another, about how we should bless those who persecute us, how we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who reap, weep, how we should live in harmony with one another, how we should not repay evil for evil, but take, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And most of all, no, if your enemies are hungry, feed them, and if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. You see, St. Paul here is giving to the Roman Christians something to do that's different. But he doesn't say, do these things and you will be noticed. He doesn't say, do these things and everybody's going to shout hosannas for you and say that you're special. He says, do these things because this is what God's done for you. Do these things because God's love is there for you when you felt loveless, when you felt unlovable. He's saying is that when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, what he's really saying is focus on the divine things when most of the time we're attracted to Peter's point of view, the earthly point of view. And yet, if we look, if we look hard, if we remember, if we think, and if we search out those opportunities for ourselves and search out finding what other people are doing, we will see that quietly, privately, there are lots of people who are picking up their cross and following Jesus. And so I encourage you as well to go. To go out and to quietly, privately, not with news cameras, not with anybody watching. Share Jesus. Share Jesus in ways that are divine, which means share Jesus by loving in the ways that St. Paul shares we should. Loving when we shouldn't, loving when we don't want to, loving when no one will notice, but still bringing that love of Jesus to the world. In Jesus' name.